In this tutorial, we will be looking at how to simulate real operational amplifiers. In order to do this, we have to have a model which reflects the real characteristics of an operational amplifier. Microwave Office is a high frequency simulator and hence has very many models, but mostly for devices which are meant to be used at radio frequency or microwave frequency. For something which operates at relatively low frequencies, so for more analog devices, what we need to do is try to find models that we can import into Microwave Office. One of the most popular simulators for analog circuits is SPICE and its variations, which can be P-SPICE or LT-SPICE, for instance, and LT-SPICE is indeed available to you. However, to use the SPICE models, we don't have to use SPICE. We can actually try and find them on the internet and then import them into Microwave Office. So this is the first thing that we'll do. Let's go to Google and then we'll type in 741 SPICE model. Now, although there are various variations on SPICE, P-SPICE, LT-SPICE, I always do my search by using SPICE alone. You can see that the first hit is from Texas Instruments, so we'll open this in a new tab. And then we'll go to the Tools and Software tab on the page. And you can see that we've got a zip file with the PSPICE model in it. You can import pretty much any variation of SPICE into Microwave Office. So whatever you find should still work. So let's click on this to download it. And then of course we need to unzip it. So we right click and extract it to here. And you can see that we've got a text document uh, which has got the uh, name of the device that we want. If we right click and look at its properties, you can see that its extension is uh, 301, which isn't really very helpful because normally PSPICE circuits have the extension .cir. But you will see that you don't need to change the name of the extension to import this into Microwave Office. So we know where our model is now. We'll just copy the location and then we'll go on to Microwave Office. And in order to import this model that we found, we have to go into the Project tab, right click on Netlists and then choose Import Netlist. Then we have to give it the location, of course, which I've copied. And here is the file that we downloaded with the extension 301. We click on this and then click on open. Now you can see the Microwave Office asks us what type of file is this? Since it doesn't have the extension that it recognizes, we have to specify what type of file it is. But we saw this on the download page. They told us it was a PSPICE file. So just select PSPICE and then click on OK. Now we've got uh, this uh, window opening up which comes from right here. So you can always access it under netlist and the name of the file. And this basically models the uh, device and uh, gives us a uh, five inputs um, device, which we can then use in our simulator. Now I'll have to show you something uh, that happens when you import the file, because you may find it a little bit confusing. If I go back to the file that I originally had, and I open it up in Notepad, and then I put these two windows next to one another, you can see that the original file had a clear indication as to what pin is what. So it's telling you that pin 1 is non inverting input, pin 2 is in the inverting input, pin 3 is the positive uh, terminal of the power supply, pin 4 is the negative power supply, and 5 is the output. Unfortunately, this alignment, when you import this type of file in Microwave Office, kind of goes out of the window. And you can see that now here, we don't have that anymore. However, if you scroll down, you'll still be able to see the order of the pins. 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. And this will correspond to these ones here. But the best way to make sure you know uh, what, which pin is which, is to simply look at the file in the notepad. So don't simply rely on what the simulator imports. Also look at the original file and that may give you a bit of extra information uh, as to what is what. Nonetheless, don't panic. This actually isn't at all a problem 
because microwave office offers us a different trick to uh, sort things out, which we'll see in a few moments. So now we've imported a model for our 741. How do we use it? Well, firstly, we have to open a new schematic as usual. So right click on circuit schematic, click on new schematic, and then we'll call it real op amp. Now we need to somewhat take the model that we've imported into our schematic. And there are two ways to do this. Either you go right up here and you click on the sub circuit icon. Upon clicking on it, you can see that it gives you the, all the sub circuits uh, on a list. Of course, there is only one, which is the model for our 741. It tells you that it's got five ports and we can simply place it by clicking OK and then placing it like so. Another way to do it, if I just remove it for a moment, is pressing Control K and then this comes up again and it is the same procedure. So click on OK and place. Now, if you remember, uh, we have one being the non-inverting input, two the inverting input, three and four the positive and negative power supplies, and five the output. This is hardly helpful in this form. We have to remember which pin is which, and it's all a little bit confusing. But here's the trick. You just right click on the box, and then choose properties, then choose the symbol tab, and in here you will find the symbol for an op amp. So if you scroll down, you get to a point where you have an op-amp with five pins at aplac.syf. Click on that and then click on OK. Now you can see that uh, we've got a symbol which we can easily recognize. So one was the non-inverting input, two the inverting input, three and four the positive and negative power supply, and five the output. So this has made life a lot easier for us, and this is a great feature of Microwave Office. One of the real aspects of the op-amp is that you have to have some DC power supplies in order for it to operate. There are several ways to do this, and I will show all of them to you so you can then pick what you fancy the most. The easiest of them all is to simply add two DC uh, power supplies in the normal way that we've done before. So we'll click on Control L and we'll look for something called DC voltage source and then I will rotate it a little bit and put it here. Remember that pin 3 was our positive power supply. So we'll connect this to pin 3 and then the other side of course has to have a ground. Let's say that we want to make this 10 volts and then we can also simply click on it, press Ctrl C and Ctrl V and create a second power supply down here. Of course, this also has to have a ground connection. And then we will make this minus 10 volts. And this will work fine. So we're saying plus 10 and minus 10. And this is the absolutely easiest way to do it. Having said that, uh, normally an op-amp, uh, you basically provide a certain voltage across its terminals say in this case would be 20 volts overall and it finds the ground reference as the midpoint between the two power supplies. So if you wanted to reflect that a little bit better we can simply remove these, place uh, one power supply right here and we put the ground right at the bottom of it and then connect it to the uh, plus terminal and then we can have another power supply placed right here and we connect the bottom of it to the negative terminal. You can see that now the nominal value of the two power supplies is the same. It's 10 volts and 10 volts. It's not plus 10 and minus 10. This is because you've set the reference point, which is ground, right here. And you're saying this is 10 volts above the ground and this is 10 volts below the ground. Notice that the minus terminal is uh, the one that is connected to the negative power supply here. So this is another way to do it. But the way that I like the most is to have the power supplies away from my device because you will be putting a lot of stuff around it. So I don't want to have this bit of circuitry hanging about whichever way you connect it. And there is a way to uh, make this really compact and put the power supplies somewhere else but still connect them to the op amp. So let's delete these power supplies here. Now, what I'm going to do is to 
again, place a power supply on the schematic with its own ground connection there. This would be the plus 10 volts. And then I'm going to find another element called a named connector. So I'll do control L and then type in N con. And this brings up this little diamond here. Now you can change the name of this one to whatever you please. I will call this PVCC to say that this is plus VCC and in hence is the positive uh, power supply. And then I will create another power supply right next to it. And I will set the value of this to minus 10 volts. And then of course I need a ground reference again over there. I need another name connector which I can just simply copy from here. So I'll just press Control C, Control V, and then place it right here. Of course, I have to change the name now of this connector. You have to be very careful here. I'll call this NVCC to specify that it's the negative power supply. So now, if you copy these named connectors anywhere on the schematic, you can effectively connect them to the top of the power supplies, which is great. So I want my positive power supply to go to my terminal 3. So I'll do Control C. Control V and place it right here. Now this uh, pin here, pin 3, would be effectively connected to the 10 volt power supply. And then I can do the same for the negative power supply. So if I press Control C and Control V and then rotate this a little, I can then connect the negative power supply to my op amp. So this is a great thing because you can move this as far away as you want uh, from your uh, op amp and then this gives you plenty of space to put your circuitry around it. So we've uh, looked at how to import PSPICE models. We've seen how we can then place the module into the schematic and we've done so with our op amp and we've connected the power supply rails to it, which is what um, differentiates it from the ADO model. Now what we'd like to do is to be able to draw the V out versus V in characteristic as we did for the ideal op amp. This, however, is a real op amp, so there are a few things that we will have to change uh, in order to plot the characteristic properly. The model inside is not just a mathematical model, and so certain things we won't be able to do um, just because of the way uh, things operate within the simulator. First of all, let's get ourselves a load resistor, so press Ctrl L, and then we'll place it at the output like so, and place a ground connection at the bottom of it. Let's make it a little bit bigger than we did before. Before we had one kilo ohm, and this time I'll actually make it 10 kilo ohms, just because I want to make sure that the output resistance of the real model, which is not very high, but it's finite, won't affect the operation of the circuit as I plot my V out versus V in. Then we'll connect the output terminal to our load. And you remember that here we had simply a uh, voltage source connected across the terminals and that worked pretty well. In this case uh, what we will do is ground one of the terminals and then uh, place a power supply on the uh, non-inverting input. So we'll simply source a swept voltage source and place it right here connected to the non-inverting input and then place a ground connection at the bottom of it. So uh, we are effectively doing the same thing as we did before, but this time we are specifying a ground reference for one of the terminals. And this is important because of the physical elements that are within this model. And to make it work, we just have to do this. Although in principle uh, and in theory, it shouldn't be any different to what we did earlier. It's just one of those things that you have to do uh, with uh, real models. The other thing that we are going to change is the uh, voltage sweep. As you may recall earlier we simply had a voltage sweep between uh, one microvolt and one millivolt and it was all positive. It didn't matter if it was positive or negative because we had a perfect straight line as a V out versus V in characteristic. This is to do with the fact that the op amp was entirely ideal. However with the real op amp we have a positive and a negative power supply and those will constitute our top and bottom limits and we want to be able to see both. To be able to see both we have to go to negative voltages as well as positive voltages and see where we hit saturation. So in this case our voltage sweep will encompass negative voltages as well as 
positive voltages. Let's say that we start from minus 1 millivolt and then our stop voltage will be 1 millivolt. And also we'll go in incremental steps of 10 microvolts. Uh, the two major differences between this case and the case of the ideal op-amp are that we've chosen a much larger load resistance and the reason for that is that if we choose a really large load resistance the output resistance of the op-amp itself will matter a lot less. Then the other thing that we changed was a change in the range to encompass both negative and positive voltages. In the case of the ideal op-amp this didn't matter because we didn't have any bottom or top limits. In this case we have a negative limit as well as a positive limit so we want to be able to see both. Now to be able to plot our graph of course we have to be able to measure the voltage of the output so the last thing left to place is a voltage meter, press Ctrl L and place a voltage meter across the terminals of our load resistance like so. Then we can go to the project tabs, uh, right click on graphs, select new graph, we'll call it V out versus V in. Then we right click on the graph, choose add a new measurement, we'll have to choose the nonlinear section yet again and voltage, then VDC, we'll have to choose the data source name to be the real or pump schematic, We'll click on the three dots to pick the measurement component as our voltage meter and click on OK. And we want to use our swept power supply for the x-axis. So you've got many choices but you've got to have it on the x-axis to do V out versus V in. Click on apply and then OK. Then simulate. And you can see that now we've managed to plot the characteristic of our op amp. You can also see that the top voltage that we can get to is about 7.8 volts and the bottom voltage that we can get to is about minus 7.8 volts. So you can see that now our model is looking very real indeed and you can also see that the input range which you can have uh, without saturating the amplifier is really really quite tiny. In fact we can measure that from the graph. We can simply right click on the graph and select add marker and then we place one right here and then we can again right click select add marker and place one up here. We can also see the difference between the two quite easily by simply right clicking and making one of the markers the reference marker. Now you can see that the delta between the two markers on the x-axis which is the top one here it's about 88 microvolts. So the maximum voltage swing that we can have at the input without saturating the amplifier is only 88 microvolts. And you can see that although we have 20 volts across the power rails of the amplifier, the only usable uh, voltage swing is 15.5 volts. So yet again, as in the case of the ideal amplifier, if we just use it uh, on its own, we have very little use for it because we can only amplify very, very small signals. And hence we will have to use something different, some other network around it, to be able to uh, make it more useful and apply it in uh, very many situations.